Work in Ensemble Automator and we've developed the Uncertainty Quantification Framework for any ML model. Before delving into the specifics, why do we need to quantify uncertainty in the first place? Well, the core goal of ML is to make predictions. Since these predictions are made on unseen data, we need to evaluate our model's accuracy on test distributions. The major problem with that is these just results are binary. This leads to AI systems without proper accountability. Uncertainty quantification helps us understand the reliability of a model and gives an explanation to the end user why it made the decision it did. Now, you may be wondering, why not just use a generative learning algorithm like Naive Bayes or GDA to solve this? The problem is that these algorithms need access to the underlying prior distribution, which may not always be the case in most real life scenarios. To solve this, we make use of the idea of conformal predictors that make predictions according to how similar the current observation is with respect to other data points. Based on this notion, we've developed this idea of p-value, which receives credibility level, representing the confidence of our prediction above a certain significance level. We've used our model in various applications, such as image classification, sequence prediction, robotics, and risk analysis. And as you can see onto the table, leveraging our techniques via conformal prediction generated better results in every case. So without further ado, let's showcase some of our results using conformal prediction. In light of COVID, we built a CNN that could detect if a CT scan was COVID positive or negative. As you can see onto the graph to the right, as the model became more confident about his prediction, the results improved. Leveraging our technique is also a viable solution to check for IID in data sets as you can see from the graph to the left that the confidence level follows a normal distribution. Using our model to evaluate credibility of loan prediction is a great idea as we've shown that as the model's confidence increases, the percent prediction accuracy also improves. This can be useful for companies like Capital One or Wells Fargo that would now have to spend less time manually checking for loan insurances. We've also proven that this technique is not limited to just structured data. This is good news because any of you can use your existing model and feed it into our network and it would automatically help you interpret your results. Here, as you can see, uh, there are two different agents trying to land between the two yellow poles and We've shown that as the model becomes more confident about its next action, it tends to make better and more reliable decisions. It is very important to realize that these agents were trained without any prior human knowledge or rules fed into the system. The so-called reinforcement learning agents learn to fly based on thousands and thousands of episodes of self-play using policy grading methods based on actor critic algorithms. We can also leverage these reinforcement learning algorithms like Actor Critic to help build better explainability models, like what were the most important factors in the machine learning algorithm making its decision. And that's it for Ensemble Automator. Thank you. Machine learning is being applied all around us to solve scientific and societal issues. Since the rise of COVID-19, the use of face masks has been encouraged in order to reduce the number of cases. Our project focused on detecting whether or not individuals were wearing face masks. It is different from existing works because it not only studied the detection of a face mask being worn, but also if it was worn correctly and not under the nose. We began with gathering a large data set of images. Using the images, we used and repurposed existing programs to create a multi-layer neural network that implemented a 2D convolution on the input computing a predictive output of the style of mask wear. Mask, no mask, mask with the nose showing, and mask on the neck. This style of wear was the classification of our problem. The training data set contained four fundamental Cartesian points, which represented the rectangular box that bordered the face of a person in each picture. Instead of convolving the entire image input, the first layer in our CNN was given a snippet of the face in the image. Initially, the images were only being read to detect if a face mask was worn or not. To increase accuracy of whether or not the mask was worn properly, we created another program which tested the effect of changing the box coordinates in the input data. The model first used the box as the start of the convolutional process, after which the coordinates were mapped to open CV rectangles for annotation of faces in images. We then implemented the changes back into our original program and the accuracy increased exponentially. The outputs that were obtained were classified correctly into the four categories. 
Figure 2b is a good representation of usefulness of the box coordinates in our input data. This is because not only did the program recognize the face mask, but also that it was worn properly. Figure 3 shows the frequency of some features contained in our data set out of 6,024 images. This figure shows the number of data points for each classification that we derived from the data sets. Additionally, the idea of face mask detection can be further studied to increase accuracy. Since the number of features was larger than expected, the dataset became more applicable to real-life situations since the sizes of the masks and the people wearing them were not definitive. By implementing our project with live sensors, stores or restaurants can automate face mask detection and could potentially set it up with alarms. So our project was to predict financial market volatility using time series techniques. So financial time series exhibit a phenomenon called volatility clustering, in which periods of high volatility will tend to be followed by more periods of high volatility. So though financial market returns are often unforecastable, very unpredictable, volatility is often very forecastable. And we attempt to do so using three time series methods. So the first was a gradient boosted autoregressive model. So autoregressive models are really just linear regression models. You're trying to predict a variable in the current period using lags of that variable. So if we're predicting volatility, we'll use the previous period's volatility and the previous period before that. Um, and that can go for as many lags as you wish. Um, gradient boosting is essentially a technique to improve the fit of a linear model. Um, you fit a linear model, then you subset the residuals and then try to predict fit more linear regression models on the subset of the residuals and sort of form a tree to improve uh, predictive accuracy. So Garch or the ARMA model is very similar to an autoregressive model. Um, but in addition to the autoregressive component, it has something called a move, moving average component. And the moving average component really just takes, um, uses forecasting errors from previous periods as a predictor, predictor in the current period. And that gives the, um, the model sort of like a long-term memory. Um, observations from long in the past will influence what the moving average component is in the current period. And that tends to improve fit quite substantially. The last model we used was the recurrent neural network, which is essentially a neural network that has a feedback structure to essentially take output from one period um, one iteration and plug it into a later iteration. Uh, the big difference between this model and the other two that we were using though is the recurrent neural network's ability to handle nonlinear data. And in theory, um, when working with nonlinear inputs, uh, this should end up leading to fewer losses um, in the results. However, our results showed that the Garch model ended up being the most accurate uh, kind of despite uh, this nonlinear capability in the RNN. Uh, and this is kind of due to our uh, inability to tune the, the hyperparameters like in the best way possible. Um, with the gradient boosted arch, it's a lot easier than with the RNN because there's fewer parameters to tune um, and it's just a lot more manageable of like an optimization problem. Uh, so we were able to get uh, closer to the Garch, but the RNN uh, definitely there's like a lot of components and a lot more that uh, needs to go into it. So uh, moving forward, if we were to continue with this project, we would definitely want to spend more time uh, trying to optimize the RNN uh, and bring it kind of more in range with the Garch and the gradient boosted arch. Hello, I'm Andrew Caldwell. My partner for the project was Josh Volkar, and we created a movie, re movie recommendation system for machine learning. For this project, we decided to create a recommendation system for movies inspired by how Netflix and Amazon are able to automatically recommend content to their users. While this has been done already, not everyone has a Netflix or Amazon subscription and may use open source applications to watch movies or general media content, so we still felt like there is a niche for this. To implement this feature, we wanted users to be able to insert a movie they've seen or like and have the program recommend similar movies that they would possibly enjoy. The program currently displays 10 movies for the users to browse through. For our data set, we found an online database that 
They have 11 key descriptors for almost 7,000 movies. Uh, these movies are comprised of the of 220 popular movies between 1986 to 2016, and it contains key descriptors um, that we really wanted to search through, such as the director of the movie, the genre of the movie, the IMDb score of the movie, and the writers of the movie. To achieve a desired end result, there were several decisions and algorithms we chose to use. One of the first decisions we ended up making was figuring out ways to reduce the data size. Uh, with over 7,000 films in the initial database, uh, the runtime and general quality of output of the program could be compromised. So we decided to eliminate all movies below a 7.0 IMDb score. This still leaves 2, 000, over 2,000 films left in the database. So it doesn't compromise the sample size entirely and uh, recommends generally higher quality films uh, by leaving out just low score, low rated films. Another quality of life improvement we elected to create with the program is by randomizing the database order each run. Um, this prevents users from implement, uh, inputting the same movie and same filter and avoiding getting the same movie over and over again. Um, by randomizing it, the uh, first results are randomized each run through, so it provides a variety of choices for the users. One of the first filtering uh, approaches we used was a single filter search using uh, either one of four keys, genre director, writer, or top build actor. Um, and this was mostly implemented using cosine filtering. Uh, here the program takes in a single movie title. Uh, it finds the index of that movie title in the database after it's randomized, and it searches for all movies with the same category. Um, this would be, um, the user would put in a movie title and they would want to search through genre, so it would return a sorted list of all the movies that have the same genre. Uh, the filter category is the same, the program depends on once the data file. This is mostly used for collaborative filtering, which we plan to use in the future. Um, combined with a weighted approach, um, we can increase the variety of movies that are recommended to users and by using a, and we elected to use a weighted approach as we felt that some keys were more important than others. Um, currently the genre has a weight of 1 and actor, director, and writer have a weight of 0 0.5. For results, we have two screenshots shown of the output from the console both using two different filtering techniques, one for genre and one for movie director filtering. The database was the same for all compilations, but randomized each time. The techniques we hypothesized to solve our task at hand included k-means, clustering, canon, collaborative filtering, and content-based filtering. We are in the process of combining techniques for optimal results with collaborative filtering being the best method as of right now. Possible ideas for improvement would have to be multiple genres for each movie. Most movies can't properly be described by just one genre, and multiple would achieve more desirable results. This can also be applied to the star actor. Only one is shown, but many movies can have multiple actors. We could also have a larger database with only 6,820 movies. Many movies aren't included and don't make the cut, and more data would achieve more accurate results. For our project, we did an analysis of academic papers regarding PCB defect detection and classification. Uh, pictured here are a handful of common defects on PCBs. This is the type of thing we'd be looking to detect and classify for this problem. The first challenge we noted in our research was that many of these different papers uh, talked about the, the difficulties in finding available images to train their models with. So the different papers address different ways of solving this issue and augmenting their data sets, some of which were photoshopping artificial images, some of which were duplicating images, and then using image processing techniques to create kind of false secondary images. Um, there are a lot of different techniques that people used, uh, and, and this problem is, is one that was common to a lot of the different groups. Uh, jumping into the first model that we looked at in detail for our research, uh, it was called the referential method. We can see in the picture on the right here, we have two side-by-side -side images of PCBs. Uh, essentially what we would be doing is 
placing the image on uh, an apparatus, taking pictures of them, and then using that to train the model. Um, essentially, we, we take a subtraction of one image minus the next, and then we end up with the resulting image. We take that resulting image, feed it to the neural network, and, and, or, or some sort of machine learning model, and, and that's how we would determine what kind of defect it was. But this whole referential method had some flaws with it. One was that it was tedious to line all the pictures up one by one. And the other was that the more we process these images and the more that we you know, subtract one from the next and all those different steps, we lose more and more data uh, and, and we have less data to train the machine learning model with. So that introduces the convolutional neural network or CNN, which addresses this, is this issue by reducing or actually eliminating the need for reference images. Uh, pictured here is one example of a, uh, a setup for a CNN. Um, this isn't the only setup, but this is one of the setups that our, our papers that we had studied used. So this CNN wasn't perfect either, though, because typically CNNs used in image processing are used to detect features and images that are fairly large or relatively large, as pictured here on the right. Um, for this problem, we're looking at defects that are very small. Uh, so there's this problem where the CNN couldn't classify very small defects. And that brings us to our last paper that we studied, which took the classical CNN and modified it in ways to make it better for smaller defects. The first of which that they used was k-means clustering on their training data, which allowed them to set more appropriate anchor weights uh, for their model. The second thing that they did was that they used what they called multi-scale feature fusion that allowed them to look at lower level details as well as higher level details simultaneously, which we can see here on the bottom right. So with the combination of those techniques, they improved the CNN. Welcome to Gun Detection, utilizing uh, convolutional neural networks, presented by me, Nick Dybin, Charlie Kelly, and Spencer Bouval. To start off, the reason for our project is that gun violence has drastically increased, both in the U.S. and around the world. And we believe that image processing can be used in order to solve this problem. To be more specific, we believe that using a uh, image processing technique in order to identify weapons and potentially even identify types of weapons could help law enforcement around the world. To talk a little bit about our methodology, we used Kaggle for our data set, uh, which you'll see later to get, acquire a data set on handguns, as well as TensorFlow and a pre-trained single shot detector model from their API. Uh, I was trained on their COCO database, which is common objects in context, things such as people, pets, chairs, cars, uh, and then we trained that on our data set of handguns and weapons in order for us to get a working model that could detect objects in a frame or a picture with handguns. For our data set, we started off with a Kaggle data set with 333 images of guns. So first we split uh, into a testing and training data set with 300 images in the training and 33 in the testing. The labels provided in the Kaggle data set didn't match the TensorFlow labels necessary for training. So we used a program called Label IMG, which allowed us to draw rectangles around the guns and auto-generated XML files for the images. And then from these XML files, we could generate CSV files that were useful for training in TensorFlow. This slide shows some of our experimental results. As you can see, in most cases, guns are detected. Um, in some cases, as you can see near the bottom right, we detect two guns successfully. But then if you look in the middle, sometimes we miss a gun and only classify one. Um, and then if you look at the far top right, there are some cases where we miss a gun completely. But overall, classification works pretty well. So to talk about a semester in summary, uh, this ended up being honestly a lot harder of a project than we initially imagined, uh, both for the extensive software installation as well as getting the TensorFlow model training properly and getting our data set fixed how TensorFlow specifically wanted it, uh, as well as the network ended up training very, very slowly with TensorFlow. Um, and we got a rudimentary model working that definitely could have been better uh, based on probably a larger data set as well as a couple other factors. But honestly, we're really excited that we got it working uh, to where it is. Hey, uh, this is Ujwal Jain.
Hi, I'm Southwick. And uh, for our uh, final project for machine learning, we created an application called G Sharp. Um, the uh, G Sharp is basically a music genre uh, detection application. We uh, we can detect any song from a Spotify library and classify into one of the three genres like rock, jazz, and hip hop. Okay. Using the Spotify API, we extracted eight key features uh, to improve our algorithm and help us to classify these songs better. Using these key features, we used a database of 500 songs from each genre we use this to uh, weigh each of our key features according to the genre. We also extracted the key features of the genre using this. We ran our KNN classification method to see which, uh, which genre was the most closely related. To test the algorithm, we used an input of 30 songs from each genre. We had the maximum success with hip hop which was because of the fact that it had the most distinctive key features. We had the least success with rock because it had a lot of overlapping features with the other two genre. And we had about an 86% success with jazz. Going forward, we're looking to improve the accuracy of our classification algorithm by training it with a much larger data set of each of our three genres. We are also looking to add a few other key features which helps our algorithm classify a much larger range of songs. Um, we are also looking to identify uh, guitar chords from a solo guitar performance. Uh, uh, we, we are doing so by training our algorithm uh, to understand basic guitar notes. So uh, this was all about our application G Sharp. Um, thank you. So for our final project, we were predicting the relative hand strength of poker hands in No Limit Hold'em. In No Limit Hold'em, you are given two whole cards, which is called your hand, and there's five board cards, which are shared amongst all players. In this example, the two uh, cards which make up your hand are the four of hearts and four of clubs, and the board would be the seven of spades through the five of clubs seen on the right. The features we used for this hand were the uh, seven suits and seven uh, ranks of the cards. Uh, the ranks were one through 13, and the suits were one through four, and the, the example is given on the screen. Additional features we used were the suit sum, where we added the total sum of all the suits, and also the hand and board sum, where we added the total sum of the hand and board. However, we noticed the suit sum did not increase accuracy a lot, but the hand and board sum did. So for our labels, uh, we started with just the raw ranking 1 to 1,081, because that's how many hands there are on a given board. Uh, and then we ended up just normalizing it to be 1 to 100, so it's now a percentile. We used KNN as our main classifier, as, that was just, as this was the most accurate classifier that we saw. We achieved an R-squared score of 0.78 and a standard deviation of 9.84, and we noticed that three nearest neighbors performed the best. This is far better than any other classifier that we used. So we also used a couple other classifiers. We used linear regression. Uh, we got a standard deviation of 27.39 percentiles using the same data set and same features. This is considerably lower than the KNN classifier though. Uh, and then we also used SVM and using the same data set and same features, it took too long to compute because the data set was too large. So why is this useful? This is useful because there is over 133 million different possible hand and board combinations. And if you were to, to know the percentile ranking of each hand, it can help you strategize and determine what, how much you should bet based upon if you have a very strong hand, if the percentile is very high, or not bet, or even fold if your percentile is very low. So our conclusions, uh, we found that k neighbors performed the best of all the algorithms that we tried. And we think we were fairly successful with a standard deviation of nine because qualitatively that's a margin of error that would still be useful for a new player to consider the strength of their hands. 
We also learned a lot about the strategy, so the connectedness of the board greatly improved our accuracy. So that's something we can look at when determining the strength of our hand, as well as uh, the number of suits on a board is also less important than we thought, except in specific cases when a flush is possible on the board. Hi, everyone. Our project about COVID-19 confirmed cases prediction based on deep learning. Our team members are Yang Tailin, De Ming Li, Yuan Hao Wang, and Zhi Yi Liu. COVID-19 has been seriously affecting our life quality, not only in the United States, but all over the world. Our main goal is to predict the future trend of COVID-19 positive inquiry cases to ensure citizens to be familiar with the future trend so that we can better plan our life. First, what is recurrent neural network? Recurrent neural network is a class of artificial neural networks where connections between nodes form a directed graph along a temporal sequence. This allows it to exhibit temporal dynamic behavior. In more plain language, imagine you like to play basketball, swimming, and snowboarding sequentially. Then you decide to take one month's vacation. After you went back, you still want to keep sporting. What sport should you choose? You can determine the sport based on previous sequence through recurrent neural network. Here, in this graph, red trend is about daily new positive increase cases, and the blue trend is about recover increase cases. We separate previous 80% data to be training data then we let our model to learn from those data and others to be testing data where we test the result. In our model, we use every 17 days feature data to get the 18th day prediction on positive inquiry cases. We use three different types of model derived from recurrent neural network, long short-term memory, by long short-term memory, and gate recurrent unit. Long short-term memory unit include the memory cell that can maintain information in memory for a long period of time. In figure four, the green trend is a prediction from our model, and the blue trend is actual positive inquiry cases recorded. Figure five shows the future trend on 45 days. By LSTM is a special kind of LSTM that runs from two directions, one from the past to the future, and one from future to the past. In figure six, the prediction drops near the end maybe because we don't have enough data from future to the past. GRU is similar to LSTMs, but use a simplified structure. Our predict trends from all three models are close to true trend. Since our models learn from the past, it cannot include every possible change in the future, but it is still very reasonable. Therefore, government and the medical departments can take actions accordingly based on the future trend. Thank you guys for watching. Video for observing machine learning methods to predict the stock market by Devin McCulley. This project is a literature review into stock market prediction models. There's a lot of data for this application of machine learning, but it is usually really hard to make sense of it all and predicting stock prices would be very profitable if successful. So that's why I chose to do this project. A quick look into machine learning methods useful for time series, such as stock prices are SVN, KNN, neural nets, and hidden Markov model. And through my research, the hidden Markov model was pretty popular for this application. And most papers did Gaussian HMM, but I, chose to do the multinomial HMM because it's simpler. For a quick summary of a hidden Markov model, it works by having observations that influence the hidden state of the model. There's a transition probability between states depending on the current state. And there's also a probability associated with observations leading to a certain hidden state. Through some probability work with Bayes' rule, the most likely next observation can be predicted and multinomial means that the observations belong to a class. And so I used a model with one dimensional observation, which was the price change calculated as a day's close price minus the close price from the day before. So turning that into a binary, my observation was either increasing or decreasing with one meaning increasing and zero meaning a decreasing stock price. 
and this model is fitted using sequences of observations. I implemented my model in Python and had a sliding window of time for observations used to train the model and then a prediction would be made and compared to the actual price change for the next day and then the window slides along and the success rate is calculated for how many were correct and through testing I found that the best number of states is three and the best window size is 300. There were two baseline models used alongside mine, and the first one was to predict always increasing or one for the observation, and the second one was to always predict the same observation as the day before, and my success rate was 0.58, and the first baseline success rate was 0.57, so it was a very competitive baseline, and I found that giving the model 300 days of data, it would just train to learn that always buying is a good thing or that the, the price will always be increasing. And so it was a very competitive baseline and uh, my model did well. Hi, this is Jeff Pierce and Sally Owen, and we performed an analysis of geospatial image classification methods. Now this project uses Esri's ArcGIS Pro software for geospatial data imaging and processing, and it looks at four different classification methods, supervised pixel-based, unsupervised pixel-based, supervised object-based, and unsupervised object-based classification. Now we know how supervised and unsupervised classification work from class, so let's briefly go over pixel-based versus object-based classification. In pixel-based classification, the algorithm will scan every individual pixel of the image and classify each individual pixel based on that pixel's value. In object-based classification, the algorithm will first scan the image for object borders uh, defined by where adjacent pixels differ noticeably in value. Um, once it has this collection of objects within uh, the image, it will classify uh, each object as a whole uh, based on the color of the pixels within that object. Now the goal of this project was to outline a plan to apply whichever classification algorithm we deem to be optimal to a consumer application. If you're familiar with the game GeoGuessr, we were thinking we'd do something a little bit like that. Uh, now we are going to determine the optimal classification algorithm um, by, taking into account, by taking into account certain factors, including the algorithm's run speed, the accuracy of the algorithm, and the ease of use of the algorithm. Now this is the kind of data that we've been getting. Um, you can see the original satellite image. Now that is not our feature space. Our feature space is actually a raster image corresponding to that original satellite image. The raster was generated using LIDAR data from one of the government agencies that generated this image set. Uh, and you can see uh, resulting categorized images, uh, each of which used a different classification method. Now, even just looking at this, you can tell that the two most accurate classification methods, at least for uh, this piece of data, is the unsupervised pixel-based classification and the supervised object-based classification. Um, and between these two, um, Obviously, the supervised object-based classification is a lot more detailed. Uh, however, this does not necessarily make it any more accurate because it does uh, misclassify um, many of the pixels. Um, and the unsupervised pixel-based classification obviously isn't as detailed um, and still misclassifies many of the pixels. Uh, noticeably, uh, it struggles to differentiate between uh, cultivated or farmland uh, and uh, forest area. Now, why didn't the last slide include unsupervised object-based classification? Well, because we didn't do it. Uh, it really just doesn't make any sense to us because how would the computer identify an object uh, without initial user input, especially in an image like the one that we just showed you where the whole image is dominated by a narrow spectrum of pixels. In our example, it was a lot of browns and greens. Uh, we just couldn't come up with a way to do this. We're not even sure if we are able to do this in any way that produces a usable output. Uh, but anyways, that's our project. Uh, thank you very much. Hi, my name is Bill Norris. My name is Jamal Savage. I'm Ryan Stankwitz. I'm Alex Ryan. And we are SCORE, or Supervised Conjecture Outcome Rating Estimator. The goal of our project was to be able to predict football scores using team rankings. Previous work has already been done on this by a few other outlets. However, most of these models have not taken relative team strength into account, so we decided to attempt to expand on that. The team ranking that we chose is called an ELO rating, which is named after RPOD ELO. It assigns a rating to each team, and each team effectively wagers a portion of their rating whenever a game is played. The benefit of that is that the stronger team would wager a higher amount. So if they were to win, 
they would go up by a smaller degree, whereas if they were to lose, they would go down by a larger degree because they were so heavily favored. Another benefit is that the mean should stay constant, which helps when you expand over the years. The features that we chose to apply to our models were offensive and defensive ELO ratings, what year a game was played in, home versus away, et cetera. The algorithm that I chose to use for my model is called Extreme Gradient Boosting or XG Boost. The thing that I attempted to predict with it was the point differential between two units, so offensive points minus defensive points, and it found that the ELO ratings were very important, while the era or year wasn't as important and home or away was very like almost negligible. The algorithm I chose to use using utilizing the same features was um, random forest. And in, what my target was, was to predict the points to be scored by the home team. And as you can see here in the results, um, it's not as concise with the test labels, but it's, uh, but according to the metric, it is pretty close in predictions. The algorithm I chose was linear regression. Mine has the same features as Jamal's and Bill's algorithms, uh, but the labels can be chosen by the user. Uh, when predicting for offensive scores, the error is around the same as Jamal's, uh, but comparing the offense versus the defense, the error for offense is around 6%, while defense is around 2%. So we did this K nearest neighbors a little different from the other algorithms. We decided to classify whether a given play would result in a touchdown or not. Uh, it was turned out to not be effective since we had so few touchdown plays. The only reasonable way to do this was with one nearest neighbor, which turned out to be not accurate at all. Hello, my name is Hans Alfries. The point of my project was to create a machine learning program that is able to learn the date that a social media post, such as from the social media platform Twitter, was published according to the pieces of slang used in its post. My so machine learning system does so by using a supervised learning assisted K nearest neighbor algorithm using Euclidean distance, allowing the user to correct the system in order to better determine the most likely age of the post. The system uses a list of pre-made test cases with a master dictionary of slang terms that are used to create a bag of words for comparison. Upon starting, the system goes into a loop where, where it asks the user to input the file name of a social media post in the current working directory. It then, it then prints the predicted age of the post, asking when the post was actually published. Printing the, printing the calculated error, adding the post to the training data, doing so, and then doing so until the user inputs an invalid file name or date. The program then graphs the errors system then enters another loop where asking the user to input one of the pieces of slang from the dictionary, creating a graph a graph of how many times the word appeared by year, doing so until given an, al an invalid input. The usage of certain pieces of slang do not seem to last more than five years. However, certain pieces of slang that have other meanings, such as shade or salty, that is all. obviously Thank last you. much longer. Today I'll be talking about my survey project, Hybrid Electric Vehicle Power Control via Machine Learning. Hybrid electric vehicles 
are a combination of traditional combustion engines and power electric power propulsion. The emergence of these vehicles brings the possibility of reducing gas use and emissions, but in order to do this we need an effective management strategy for which machine learning can solve, and that is what my survey looked at. So in terms of solving that problem, there are two main directions using a real-time machine learning strategy or an offline one. Real-time ones focused on basing their information on past driving behavior, current driving conditions, and the most recent driving frame, whereas offline ones focus more on the mechanical and physical aspects such as the motor vehicle and full drive cycles. So some summaries of my research findings that offline methods are computationally more heavy, causing hours and hours of computation on a good computer, but they are the most optimal, they get the best results, however the information that they need in order to get that optimal result is not realistic, you have to know too much information ahead of time, the speeds, exactly how long you're driving for, etc, etc. On the opposite end, rule-based strategies are the fastest for real-time solutions, but they cannot reach optimal performance because they work with very little information. Knowing which features are most important for prediction, power distribution, road condition, or driver behaviors are decisions that each of the researchers had to make and this influenced their optimal ability. However, even though each of these methods worked fairly well, um, they still all relied on knowing what the surface of the road was like and they didn't take into consideration hills, things like that, or traffic. So moving forward, my recommendations are incorporating something called connected and automated vehicle technology. This technology combines two things, autonomous ability and also connection to things such as infrastructure, vehicles, cloud, and pedestrians and the use of GPS. Basically this just gives us more information about our surroundings and this is still upcoming technology so they can use even more kinds of sensors to be able to get more information that can be passed into a machine learning algorithm. And there isn't a lot of combination research with these two things, machine learning, hybrid electric vehicles, and CAV. So moving forward, combining all these will give the best results, in my opinion. Thank you. The name of my project is Machine Learning Techniques for Measuring Poverty. I'm Sujit Gavrani. I've reviewed three papers in the area of measuring poverty. The goal is to find in which area of the world the most poor people live. This can be helped in planning of government and non-profit resources. Poverty estimation is the first step towards poverty elimination. Traditional approach involves doing comprehensive household service. This can take up to half a day and is expensive. Using no novel data sources and modern machine learning techniques, poverty prediction can be done in less time. Poverty mean Proxy mean text involves doing simple service with 10 questions. This was first used in Zambia. Building machine learning model is complex and uses elastic net logistic regression with cross validation. However, the evaluation of survey results involves simple calculations. The classification into poor and not poor can be done in a short period of time with a simple survey and evaluation. Nighttime satellite imagery is available in one kilometer resolution. This is mapped to three, in three light intensities, low, medium, and high. This is then trained using mini batch gradient descent. In addition, daytime images from image net data set are used, used are trained using convolution neural network. This can be they can be used as filters. They, these can help in identifying features like roads and buildings. Both the data sets are used together. This technique is low low cost and efficient however it cannot distinguish in households within one kilometer cluster so we can identify poverty at one kilometer cluster level within a cluster cl classification at individual house level poverty classification is not performed malaysian government wants to identify 40 percent of the most poor households they have a key, they have the data set of hundred thousand households pre-processing involves cleaning feature extraction, normalization, and sampling techniques. Three, te three techniques are applied and compared, knife, based decision tree, and k nearest neighbors. Cross-validation is applied to calculate the accuracy of the models. All algorithms are achieving more than 95% accuracy. 
to conclude poverty elimination is the noblest goal of our generation and no, novel data sources along with machine learning can lead to low cost poverty prediction these are these are the references that were used thank you hello everyone today i'm going to present our project spotlight presentation my name is Chen Zhuo Li, and I have a teammate, He Yu. Since I am not in the U.S. for this semester, it's hard for us to make the presentation together. So I'm going to make today's presentation individually. Our team's project is Capture Automatic Recognizer, based on convolutional neural network deep learning. First, let me introduce the Capture. CAPTCHA, the full name is Completely Automatic Public Turning Test to Tell Computers and Humans Apart. CAPTCHA is very common in our life. That is the kind that everyone can often see on the internet let us recognize a distorted character picture. Although there are many more advanced verification methods that distinguish between humans and computers, CAPTCHA is still the most traditional and classic one. So for this project, our team's goal is to create a program that can automatically recognize the text information in the CAPTCHA image, and we hope the program can achieve the accuracy higher than 80%. To achieve our goal, we divided the project into four phases. In the first step, we are going to create a program that can generate the CAPTCHA image for dataset, since the dataset size is huge. It is impossible for us to collect it from internet, so we need a program to generate a capture image for us. In the second step, we will design a core algorithm for our machine learning and use the datasets generated in the first step for training and verification. And we will save the checkpoint result after each round of training for subsequent analyze and prediction. In the third step, we are going to use the training output and use the dataset to make prediction, and we will create a program to analyze the predicted result and visualize the output. In the last step, we are going to analyze the incorrect results and figure out what kind of capture is hard to be recognized. For completing this project, we choose TensorFlow as our core framework. TensorFlow is a free and open source machine learning software library created by Google. This framework can be used for all kinds of machine learning, but it is more focused on deep neural network learning. And at the same time, it provides a powerful API for coding. Since we plan to use convolutional neural network as our core algorithm, our team believes that this framework is very suitable for our project. For the core algorithm of our project, I mentioned earlier that it is deep learning based on convolutional neural network. Specifically, all the capture image we generated are in JPG format and with a size of 8 uh, kilobytes and 160 pixel wide and 60 pixel high. After the image is read into the program, we first convert the image from color to grayscale and then unify it. This operation removes the effect of different color and different darkness, and the picture is processed into a completely blank and white picture. After the picture is processed above, the picture will go through three convolutional operation and three polling operation. After each convolution is completed, the picture undergoes a max polling. Then we send the processed result into the long short-term memory model. Uh, because output from the convolutional neural network may cause the final prediction result to be out of order, uh, the long short-term memory model can be used to help us split the characters in the capture image to ensure the correct order of the final prediction result. So after, we, after that, we will output the result for full connection and the softmax operation, and then output the final result. Uh, we initially planned to generate more than two, 20 million CAPTCHA images for training, um, but this required more than 152 gigabytes of hard disk space to store the training sets. Uh, we later realized that our, in our model, the model parameters are changing at any time during the training, so we don't need to generate so much data for uh, training. 
but can use a small amount of dataset to reuse them in multiple rounds of training. We finally generate 1 million capture images for the training set, 100,000 images for the validate set, and 200,000 images for the test set. In order to take into account both the con convenience of reading the image label and the, pre the prevention of overwriting due to the same name, we defined the format of the generated image name as six random characters followed by the label of the image itself. After completing the above pre preparations, we borrowed a high-performance workstation for machine learning. Our entire machine learning process lasted about seven days. So interestingly, we found that in the process of training, the occupancy rate for both CPU and graphic cards did not exceed 10%, and most of the performance was in idle. Later, we believe that the performance bottleneck may appear in the addressing and reading of a large number of small size images. The rate of operation of this huge number of capture images of only 8 kilobytes makes the efficiency of the whole system drop drastically. After 71 rounds of training, we believe that the results have converged and stopped subsequently machine learning. For the first 71 rounds of learning, we visualized the accuracy rate and the lost, uh, lost value of the training set and the validate set and obtained the results. So we can find in this image that during the training process, the accuracy rate has risen rapidly while the training set or the validation set at the same time, the loss rate dropped significantly. So based on the result in above figure, we find finally selected the checkpoint value from Epoch 67. We generated 200,000 capture images for the test set. In the test set, the training result achieved a recognition accuracy of 90.4%. And if the upper and lower case is ignored, the recognition accuracy rate reaches 95.2%. And we believe that uh, accuracy rate has far exceeded our expected target of 80% accurate. So through the analyzed program, we loaded the predicted result to obtain the recognition accuracy rate and printed out all the results of incorrect predictions. Regarding the results that incorrect predictions, we have analyzed the mean type and reasons. So in here, you can see in the first image, the predicted result is lowercase r, capital U, lowercase u, and capital O, while the actual label is not capital O, but zero. This is the most common situation that we found in these pictures. Our program, our program successfully uh, distinguished the upper and lower case u. So we can see the lowercase u on the right in the picture is larger than the lowercase u on the left. So I personally, initially, I thought the two letters is uh, the two letters u were both capitalized at first, but our program successfully distinguished uh, the two letters because it found on the lower right corner of the, this small uh, this uh, lowercase u, and I think that's very impressive. And for the second image, the incorrect result was also due to the similarity of capital I and the lowercase l. In the third image, our program treated number 3 as capital letter B. This may be due to the distance between the number 3 and the letter M on the left being so close that the program failed to split them. And the rightmost of the letter M and the number 3 are so close that they look very much like the capital letter B. So for the fourth image, similar to the situation in the second picture, our program failed to distinguish between the lowercase letter L and the lowercase letter G with the same similar appearance. And in the fifth image, the prediction outcome is 7GW, while the actual label is four letters. This might be called the letter S lost during the image split. And in the last image, the predicted outcome is RNO7M.
which is one little more than the actual digit. So we think this also might be the issue when split image and part of the letter N be counted twice. Uh, so overall, I'm pretty satisfied with the project's result, and accuracy is much higher than our plan. This project also allow us to learn a lot, and at the same time, let us put what we learned in class into practice. And so that's all for my today's presentation, and thank you all. Hi, my name is Bo. I'm Marco. And this is our picture prize modeling project for machine learning. So have you ever been to the grocery store and there's just so many price tags just around that you can't really figure out what the actual price of your product is? We want to solve that issue. So we have an interest in image processing and web scraping. And we propose a project that would predict the price of a product based on the image of it. So next we had to get our data and Kaggle hosts a bunch of different data sets and one of them happens to be a Walmart data set with product links and prices. So next we had to actually gather images from these product links. So we visited each link on Walmart's website and then scraped the image source URL and reconstructed it before downloading it from Walmart's image server. After this process was over, we noticed that we had to remove some items that did not have an image available or did not have a price or were discontinued or out of stock. So for modeling, we decided to make this a classification problem by binning the prices into price tiers and then assigning each image into a price tier. Um, after some research, we found that CNNs were the industry standard for image classification and we decided to implement a CNN using the Keras library in Python. We found two different strategies that we could use for modeling. Uh, one where we train the model using continuous price tiers, so five to $10, and then immediately after 10 to $20. And then another one where there are price gaps in between the tiers. So five to $10, then, $20 to $30. So our initial model had a bit of an overfitting issue. You'll notice that in the plot at the left that our validation accuracy is lagging considerably behind our training accuracy. So we had two solution approaches to address the overfitting problem. The first was data augmentation, which involves applying random transformations to our training images, such as random flips or rotations. And the second is a dropout layer, which will randomly turn off uh, neurons in a layer, again, as a regularization technique to help prevent overfitting to the training data set. These, these techniques did prove to be quite effective. Uh, we noticed at the plot at the left, this is before applying those techniques. We noticed at about epoch 20, there was a large gap between our training accuracy and our validation accuracy. Contrast that with the plot at right, where at epoch 20, our training and validation accuracy are far closer to, together. And this shows that we have mitigated the overfitting problem to a certain extent, although there is room for improvement. But that's all we have for now. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Tim Cuny, and I'm going to be talking to you about the Royal Road Initiative, our project for machine learning. Uh, the first thing you should know is that the Royal Road is a website where people can write stories and people can also review them and follow them. We wanted to see what it took for a story on this website being written to become either successful and published or if it just fails and dies out or if it's incompleted. So we started by getting many different data points that we could obtain from web scraping the, the website, including words published per day, the amount of chapters, words, uh, and the amount of comments received per chapter. And then we would classify a story that we got the data from is true or false if it has been published or if, if it was published then it would be true but if it wasn't published and or if it just uh, died out if the book was incomplete then it would be labeled false and from this we were able to plot some data um, you can see that uh, false which is in orange sometimes it'll will mix up with the blues so you can't just go simply based off height because that's not going to solve anything but if you start to connect data like uh, say if you mix the average views and the number of pages like this graph here or the average views and the favorites you can see a clustering and you can almost see where you can draw some sort of slope in between the data to uh, make it more fit ac across a line. And so that's kind of where our inspiration for the next two parts come from. The first thing we did was make a KNN algorithm. We tested three different distance formulas, Euclidean, Manhattan, and squared chord distance. And then we found that we had these error rates accordingly. Uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.14, and 0.13. And then we run it through a, uh, an algorithm in order to find the, the K value that would give us the best error. Uh, that's the graph that you're seeing on the right. And we found that if we had a K value of 17, that would give us our best test error, uh, where our test error rate was only 0 0.1. The next thing that we did was make a C, uh, CSVD algorithm. Uh, we did this by finding the pseudo inverse of the graph that we had uh, that we created with all the data. Uh, first, after first finding the pseudo inverse, we calculated the error rate and the test rate and we got 0.34 and 0.32. I put on a linear regression algorithm in order to make the weights more fit to the line. And after we did that, we got an error rate of 0.12 and 0.10. Uh, that's our project. We're hoping that our Royal Road initiative would help artists or uh, authors create a work that both the public would like and that they don't have to waste their time completing if it was going to fail. So I think that we did a good job of, of using all the data that we could get in order to make some predictions accurately. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Wu Zhewei. The project I did is to forecast COVID-19 confirmed cases in Virginia for a specific week that starts from November 23rd, 2020. So the context is, as you all know, that the COVID-19 appeared in Wuhan, China at the end of 2019 and then rapidly spread all over the world. This is so unfortunate and sorrowful because many people died. Um, since the COVID-19 pandemic led to a historical challenge to our society, I also would like to contribute myself to this field and make some changes. So that's why I did this project. And the data I use is from Johns Hopkins. Uh, what is novel about my approach is that in this forecasting task, um, although many researchers have done confirmed cases forecasting, um, by using various machine learning and deep learning models, they seldom did a comparison between a traditional statistical model and a deep learning model. So I thought I would definitely give it a try. Um, so I did. Um, in this project, I built two models. 
I did a performance evaluation and comparison for both models. The first one is very traditional. Um, and the second one is an artificial recurrent neural network architecture uh, often used in deep learning. So I thought it would be very interesting to see which model will outperform the other one when it comes to time series forecasting. Um, in this project, it is aimed to present to you guys a comparative study upon forecasting the confirmed cases uh, between a traditional model ARIMA and a deep learning model LSTM. So I got four steps. Um, so the first step is to clean and transform and scale the data, which, uh, uh, which I call data exploration. Then I used um, two libraries. One is PyTorch and the other one is Stats Models. I used the two libraries to build the two models. Then I did some training and testing then I use the uh, mean square error for the final accuracy. Um, as you can see, the result details are here presented. Uh, for ARIMA, the uh, MSE is a lot smaller than the MSE um, of LSTM. So uh, probably due to uh, due to the large spike uh, before November twenty third, it uh, in the increased confirmed cases. A daily increase confirmed cases in Virginia. It affected my uh, LSTM model a little bit. So RIMA really outperforms LSTM. So sometimes tradition is still tradition. Hello everyone. Uh, the project we are working on is Comet Fruits Identification. This project focuses on providing a deep learning solution for fruits identification using convolutional neural networks. The goal of this project is to be able to identify the correct fruit category of a given image. The significance of this project is to provide a quick and reliable way to find out the exact type of fruits people are looking for when they're grocery shopping, or it can have business values uh, if it's applied to fruits classification in the market. To conduct the experiment, our group used the Fruits360 dataset from Kaggle. This dataset currently includes 90,380 images of 131 different types of fruits and vegetables. Uh, the dataset is then being divided into a training set and a test set. The training set contains 67,692 images and the test set contains 22,688 images images. Our group uses the Curious library inside TensorFlow to apply the convolutional neural networks. Here is the initial model we train using convolutional neural network. When we evaluate this initial model with the test data from Fruit360, we got a test loss of 46 and a test accuracy of 0.94. As you can see, the test accuracy is really good, but the test loss is really high. Then we try to use some real-world pictures of fruit from online and some taken ourselves. We noticed that the, the results were not great. For example, we took a picture of a watermelon bought from Kroger and the model predicted it as a cauliflower. One time we actually got the prediction correct is when we intentionally chose a picture of an apple that looks similar to the training data of an apple and this time we got it correct. So from the test loss and validation loss we gather when we train the model, we think that this model has a overfitting problem, so we decided to improve it. So this is the improved model. What we did was adding more hidden layers to the model with increasing filters. We also added dropout layers in hope of solving the problem of overfitting, and this time the test loss and test accuracy are improved. However, when testing using real-world fruits, even though it has improved on the previous model, the accuracy when predicting real-world fruits is still low. This sign, the model predicted watermelon and strawberry correct, but for apples, they predicted other fruits that are similar in shape. Overall, the accuracy for predicting uh, real fruits is still relatively low, even though it has improved a lot from the previous model. So here is the analysis. We think that this difference in accuracy 
when testing with the test data from Fruit 360 and Real Fruits is caused by how the dataset is collected. The author of this dataset took pictures of these fruits when they are rotating. As you can see from the picture on the left, these are pictures of the training set for Cherry. From the picture, they all look pretty similar because they are just taken from a different angle. We think that even though the dataset has around 100 images for a single type of fruits, but they are just the same fruit but from different angles, we think that this might have caused our model, model to be less accurate when trying to predict fruits in real life because there are so many different va variations. While the test data from Fruit360 are all pictures of fruit taken in similar fashion as the training set. And that's all. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jerry Lepic, and my project was reproducing the paper Bitcoin price prediction using ensembles of neural networks. So a little overview of the paper. Um, the paper was about a model to predict the next day change in Bitcoin price. Um, taking in various features such as the hash rate, which is the processing power in the Bitcoin network, and the difficulty, which is how hard it is to mine a block, and many other uh, data points, and building five different neural networks, which are each weighted differently. And then taking the five most optimal networks to make the final prediction of whether or not the price would either go up today or go down. Um, and this paper resulted in a almost 85% return in 50 days, which is pretty impressive. So what I wanted to do was look at how effective the ensemble is. And to do that, we had a look at like how the ensemble was created. So how did the how are the best networks chosen? And this paper used a something called the Gaussian method, which um, was worked with taking the genetic algorithm um, with the generalization error to find the um, most optimal networks out of the five. And we found that the higher dimensional networks were more likely to be included. Um, and that also single networks tended to have similar uh, misclassification rates as the ensemble. Along with that, various different training algorithms for, for each of these networks um, resulted in um, the similar results. So in conclusion, the Gassin ensemble was not as effective for our data as the paper suggested. Um, individual networks for this problem, we're not producing enough varied results for it to drastically change the outcome. However, an interesting um, further study could be a problem with less um, training data. And that is it. Thank you. I'm Tarun Singh, and along with my partner Edward Tiles, we're going to be talking about our project which uses binary image classification with deep learning. So the project we were trying to recreate uh, was a research paper which used a two-layer neural network with data sets to classify images of humans and horses. And our goal was to focus on recreating the results of this project while repurposing it to classify cars and bicycles instead, which could have uh, a variety of applications. And we also were trying to improve it using more layers for the neural network to improve the overall testing accuracy. So an LNN is a layered neural network consisting of layers of nodes, which train our model to then classify images. Uh, on the screen, you can see an example of a four layers uh, neural network. The original model, as Tarun said, had two layers. And to improve the original model, we found an additional research paper that used a pre-trained model called VGG16. After using that pre-trained model, we retrained the top layer ourselves to achieve higher accuracy. Um, 
in order to use that model, we organized our data of cars and bikes in Google Drive for use in Google Colab. And after processing the data sets in our LNN, we uh, saw the results. So our initial results when we were recreating the uh, results based on the paper, we calculated the train and test error for the two-layer neural network with our data initially split with 85% for training and 15% for testing. And this yielded the results that you can see here on the screen. And our results yielded a training accuracy of 97% and a test accuracy of 88% which was very close to the 80% test accuracy um, that was from the paper. And this makes us believe that our two-layer neural network was equally effective at classifying uh, our images as it was in the reference project images. Then when using the VGG16 for improved accuracy, you can see our results on the graph on your screen. Uh, we were able to achieve approximately 99% test accuracy when fitting our model uh, with and without um, cross-validation. And that completes our presentation. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Thomas Jimmy, and I'm going to present a summary of a survey of spiking neural networks for classification tasks. A spiking neural network is similar to the artificial neural network that we all think of, but instead of sending information between nodes as doubles or floats, just sends a single bit spike with its information encoded in time. You can see in the left part of the diagram an abstraction of an SNN node receiving spikes from its inputs as they move left to right through time. The state of each of these spiking neurons is determined by a function based upon its current state, and that state is increased by a weighted amount based upon the input it receives. When the state reaches a certain threshold, the neuron fires, the output spike, and is reset to a baseline state. SNNs are currently heavily used and often developed by computational neuroscientists to be very similar to the brain and based on empirical neuroscience results. The similarity allows them to gain insight into the brain's function. It also enables some improvements in power efficiency of the brain relative to digital computers. With specialized hardware, we've seen orders of magnitude increases in power efficiency over typical ANNs running on general purpose computers. This hardware to run SNNs can be an analog organization such as those using an electronic device called a memristor. This is currently being studied at Virginia Tech and other institutions. Intel and IBM have a digital approach, uh, such as the Loihi chip shown on the right. Loihi uses many specialized neural cores in a network architecture, and it has received achieved 10,000 times power efficiency increases in certain tasks. The training of SNNs is also interesting. Despite the equations for neural models not being differentiable, approximation techniques have been developed and excellent supervised training results have been achieved. For unsupervised and reinforcement learning, the notion of heavy learning is used. Heavy learning, also called spike timing dependent plasticity, is derived from neuroscience and has the input weights change based upon the difference in time between the input spike and the output spike. Despite the small amount of interest relative to ANNs, the performance of SNNs is not that far off. The error rate of the state-of-the-art ANN on the MNIST digit classification task is about 0.16%. That is compared to the 0.6% for the best spiking neural network. That best spiking neural network uses function approximation and back propagation. When you restrict yourself to RSTDP or reinforcement learning, you, found an, you find an error rate of about 2.8% and for a completely unsupervised model, an error rate of about 5% is to be expected. Given the disparity in investment between ANNs and SNNs in the history, I think it's very likely for the future to see this gap close and more reliance to fall on these energy efficient SNNs. Our project is a COVID-19 diagnoser. My name is Will Pryor. I'm Ollie Stein. I'm Diego Espinoza. I'm Nevi Elias. We made this project because in 2020, COVID-19 has caused over 275,000 deaths in the U.S. Many cases go undetected, causing people to spread the virus without knowing. The current testing method has limitations, such as the supplies needed, the amount of time required to get a result, and that patients often don't want to go into a medical facility. So a more accessible testing method could help more people know if they have the virus. 
our model uses machine learning to analyze a patient's symptoms and determine if they have COVID-19. The purpose of this project is to analyze trends in COVID-19 data uh, to draw conclusions and create a diagnosis with an accuracy similar to that of, of a traditional COVID-19 test. Through Jupyter Notebook, we are able to collect, sort, manipulate, and graph data found from any CDC report, namely the report of July 2020, but this can be applied to any of the standard CDC reports. We used an 80-20 split on training and testing data with more than 5,000 overall patients. Validation was used to calculate error to further enhance our accuracy. We represented the data by plotting on a graph labeled feature on the x-axis to represent the symptoms, symptoms that we are testing for and percent corrected on the y-axis to represent the score of each symptom accordingly. Finally, we calculate weights using a DNA parsing score matrix algorithm. So in creating our KN and algorithm and getting the weights, we analyzed the COVID-19 patient data that we did get. We were able to come up with some more interesting results along with a uh, classifier. The results being that your symptoms, uh, your current symptoms are more likely to give you a code like to be correlated to your outcome than your uh, pre-existing conditions. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Yeah. And so the way that we did this is we asked a series of 10 questions, five symptom questions, and then five pre-existing condition questions. A uh, score was given to assess how confident our algorithm was about our diagnosis along with the diagnosis. We include our diagnostic can increase public safety by increasing accessibility without having to, without having to go to the, to the testing site. Our diagnosis accuracy is similar to that of the traditional COVID-19 test, and throughout all of this research, we are able to manipulate and analyze data to draw useful conclusions. And this is our references. For our project, we looked at implementing a lot of the methods that we learned throughout the semester to analyzing heart disease statistics. We started off with a repository of data provided by the University of California at Irvine, containing around 300 samples of patients, um, each tested for heart disease, and roughly half of the data set tested positive for heart disease, while the rest tested negative. Uh, we had 13 features, which was uh, a lot relative to our sample size of 300. And I'll talk a bit about that a bit later, but we initially started off with the naive Bayes classifier. Uh, we had it split, so 85% was reserved for training with the rest reserved for testing. And we had around 88% er, uh, accuracy rate. As you can see by the chart on the right, the ones with the highest conditional probability uh, that asserted themselves more in any result uh, was prominently blood sugar. And this was a bit of a problem because a lot of the samples, regardless of whether they test positive or negative, um, had high blood sugar. And there were a couple of other inconsistencies in the data as well, which resulted in um, slightly weird outcomes. And so to fix this, we implemented variance thresholds. Uh, initially, we had 0.6, as you can see, just to distinguish from the higher ones, but this resulted in a lot lower accuracy when it came to doing our classifiers. So we included slope and the thallium stress test results and kept our variance threshold at 0.3, dropping essentially anything lower than that, as you can see there. We dropped three um, from the underlines ones. We dropped three that were most prominent in the previous slide. And so for our classifiers, we also attempted SMOTE, but most of our uh, data was categorical rather than continuous as works best with SMOTE. So Naive Bayes came out on top once again with around 90% accuracy rate, uh, with the rest following anywhere from around 79 to 84%. So um, we from our sort of classifier results and, and variance threshold analyses, we found that the greatest factors of heart disease according to our experiments were age, heart rate, and cholesterol. Uh, we did have a couple of limitations as the data set was not as varied as we had hoped. Uh, we had some features that were much more prominent than others. And definitely generating artificial data was a bit of a problem as well. Um, if we had a better data set with more varied and rounded samples, 
this experiment could have gone a lot better, um, but that could be an improvement for a future experiment.